Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel. That is the R in the RK Stumbling Bear, and I'm a reader and a writer. This first week of April has just flown by, and I can't believe that it's another week already. I believe this is my week 14 wrap up. It's pretty easy to keep track of the numbers when I'm posting the video, but I don't always remember to but I don't always remember to look before I start filming. So welcome back to a weekly wrap up. Starting with books, I have finished two books this week. The first one I finished is The Other Bridgerton by Julia Quinn. This is and this is the third book in the Rokesby Brothers Quartet. And this follows Andrew, who is the Navy guy who I guess at this point is now a privateer. It was a little jarring for me because at the end of the second book, it sets you up for Andrew, and then we jumped seven years in the future. Quinn did kind of like explain what the story his sister-in-law was telling at the end, but it still was a little bit of a jar when we got to there. And this book was almost more of a sweet romance, and I think that's due to you don't want to have a Stockholm Syndrome romance. The main character, Poppy Bridgerton, is wandering the seashore and comes across a hidden cave. Unbeknownst to her, this cave actually has things in it. It is a privateer treasure trove kind of place. And the men that come in to gather some things for their ship decide that they need to take her with them. And so she is thus kidnapped. That's where... Andrew Rokesby comes in. Of course, he's going by Andrew James because you don't want people to know you're a son of an earl when you're doing this line of work. And when he finds out that she is a Bridgerton cousin, he very quickly is like, which branch? And she's like, tells him I'm from Somerset. My uncle's the Viscount in Kent. And he's like, okay, now I know what I'm dealing with. <laughs> but due to he actually has a job from the crown, he doesn't feel like he has time to take her back ashore, clear out the cave, and they're expecting someone to pick up a message from the cave anyway, so he decides that she has to go with them to Lisbon. And this is where Quinn had to be careful with the Stockholm Syndrome. For those of you who don't know, Stockholm Syndrome is feelings of trust or affection felt in many cases of kidnapping or hostage taking by a victim toward a captor. And so Poppy is relegated to the cabin which is the captain's cabin, and he, the first two nights, sleeps on the floor, and then after that goes and sleeps in with one of his other officers. He slept on the floor the first two nights saying that he was trying to make sure that nobody was going to hurt her, but otherwise she's not allowed to be wandering about. But at the same time, she thought she was locked in, but he did, he did tell her, you're not actually locked in. In case of a fire or something, I want you to be able to get out. And here's a key, so you can, if you leave, you can get back in. Because at one point she went out to see the like, son, and then got locked out of the room. And of course he was the one who found her. Quinn does an interesting thing where she kind of sets up, first these two learn to respect one another. And while Andrew's very intrigued with her, Poppy's like, well, I mean, you've said that I, I'm going to be back in, at home in two weeks you at least sent a message to my friend who I was staying with so hopefully she doesn't you know report anything my reputation is ruined but Poppy doesn't know so Poppy's just like well what else can I do if I was in hysterics what does that actually accomplish but she's bored and so Andrew feels a desire to make her as comfortable as possible in this bad situation without actually telling her what he's doing. And he helps her, he like brings a novel that one of his crewmates had been reading, puts it on the shelf so she has she, other things to read other than like navigational books. With talking to her, he finds that she's very intelligent and he appreciates that and realizes that she probably likes puzzles. So he brings out a puzzle for her to do, to put together like all the while his attraction is kind of growing, but he's like, no, no, can't do anything. 
And so it did look like maybe the romance wasn't really going to hit off until she got back. They got back to England, and she found out. And I am going to spoil the book. Sorry. And then they ended up getting kidnapped while in Lisbon because he wasn't going to let her off the ship, and then he decided to let her off the ship, and they got kidnapped. And they had some sexy time while under cap captivity, and you know that wasn't realistic. That's not actually going to happen. Again, it's like, why? But he does say that he's not going to get her pregnant. He goes, I don't know what's going to happen to me, and I'm not going to have you come go back to your family with it. Surprise, I'm pregnant kind of thing. So there were standards <laughs> of a sort. When they're ca kidnapped, she, she had kind of figured out that he was a privateer and running stuff for the government before she, they left the ship in Lisbon. But he hadn't actually confirmed it until that time. So she gets out, she goes for help, and then she gets sent home separate from him and doesn't know if she's ever going to see him again. And then guess what? Lo and behold, things happen and they meet up. Happily ever after, they get married. It was interesting. <laughs> and it was fun to see some of the characteristics, because you meet Andrew in the first book with about Billy and George. So just seeing how some of his mannerisms are still the same even seven years later, that was kind of fun to see. And then also then to see Billy and George and then how their kind of relationship has become more comfortable. They're more they're very accepting of who they are when you see them later at the end of this book. And then the second book I finished was Monster Huntress by David Wiley. This is an adventure story that took several twists and turns that I was not expecting. And follows Ava who wants to be a monster huntress. Her dad is a monster hunter and she knows that her mother before was a huntress and so she wants to and she's been trained a little bit and it starts off where she's in her village and her and her friend find some goblins and are able to kill one of them but the other one gets away and then they go tell the elders and the elders of the village are like oh no we haven't had any monster issues for years now your your dad's taking care of all of that and so they don't believe her and she ha basically has to prove them wrong by stay you know staying true to her convictions and this book is fun because you actually get to see a parent child relationship mm -hmm. in a lot of YA there is like the parents are over there and in some parts of the book Ava is on her own and having to deal with that and make decisions but you also get to see time with her dad and how yes he's protecting her because she's 13 I'm pretty sure she's 13 and then at the same time he's training her because this is what she says she wants to do and he wants to give her the skills to survive and so then you go on her first adventure with her dad and she gets to learn that it's not the glory and adventure that she actually thought it was going to be. There are a lot of people out there who don't like hunters and have misconceptions of who they are. And then there's a lot of people who are scheming and trying to cause trouble. And there's an unknown entity that killed her mother that her dad has been hunting that still is tampering with their lives. And through all of this, you get to see her grow as a person. And from what I understand in the short stories, The Merchants of Oria, you get to see a grown-up Ava. And I think that's going to be fun to kind of get to see another side of her. And I would like more of this series. This is a series that I would definitely recommend for my relatives who are middle grade readers. I know at least my cousin's, one of her daughters, is an avid reader. And this is a book that I would highly recommend. So if you have any children in the middle grade age, and that like, I would say late elementary school into middle school, it was, it's the perfect age for this book. This is a great gateway into reading for their fantasy with middle grade. And I enjoyed it a lot. I continued working on The Secret Garden. This is a current reread. And I pick it up, I put it down. Um, I just am loving it and I've been really enjoying my time rereading this. I think every time I read it, I get to see different things from it, different ideas. 
one of the things I was noticing is, I mean, this was book was written in the early 1900s. And so Burnett, she layers in the popular attitudes of the day. Like Mary grew up in India. And so she meets a character named Martha who's like, oh, you're with the blacks, the heathens. And that's how, that's what people thought back then. And it's not to say that Martha doesn't know anything because I mean, Martha's a country less. She doesn't know anything, but you get to see how information filters down to people or doesn't filter down to people. And you also get to see the stigma of those who are disabled and how that handles things in society. And I mean, I'll be honest, the author doesn't call those things out. But again, a lot of this was accepted mindset of the time. So the kids themselves don't necessarily adhere to the common mindset, meh, mindsets of the time. And I think it's one of the reasons why I love to reread this book is because all the adults and the children are very distinct and they all have different themes. And I love Susan Sowerby and she is my favorite adult. I understand why she is never in any of the movie adaptations, but I really love her. And if you've read this book, you know who she is and why. And I will eventually finish this. I don't know if I will next week or not. I did work on Reclaim the Stars. I read the first three short stories. That I believe there are 17 short stories if I remember right. And they are split between science fiction, fantasy, and kind of other, which from what I've seen is more like time travel-esque stories. And so the first section is science fiction, so I read the first three in there. So the first three are Reign of Diamonds by Anna Marie McLemore, Fletcher by Daniel Jose Older, and The First Day of Us by David Bowles. And so far my favorite is The First Day of Us. About a polyamorous group as they are kind of realizing the, the first day that they actually were. Talks about how they met and how they ended up being a polyamorous unit. Um, I'm enjoying this. It has some very different perspectives and I think everything, every, all three of the stories I've read, there are things that I liked about them. Of course, I love science fiction, so we'll see how much I like them when I get to the fantasy stories or the time travel. Not a huge time travel fan, but yeah, so I'm gonna be continuing to work on this. And then also this week I started The Duke and I by Julia Quinn. This is the first story in the Bridgerton series of the eight siblings and I have not read it before. What happened is last fall when I first watched Bridgerton I watched that first season and then I read the next seven books and I figured yeah this time I should probably go back and read the first book to see how closely does the book follow it. And I can tell that this book ha has gotten a lot of love. It has way more character depth than you see later on in the series with the younger siblings. Yeah, I, I really am, am enjoying Daphne more than I did in that first series. I'm not in a hurry to finish it because I already know how it ends. That's kind of one of my quirks. When I know how it ends, I might not... It might take me longer to finish it. The same thing happened when I read The Martian a couple years ago. That is what I have finished and am currently reading. So for this week, I, I'm still working, or my priority reads, or the things I really want to focus on, are my Aurelian Magical readathon prompts, especially since I only have three. So that is where I'm reading the short stories for Reclaim the Stars. And then also, I have Root Magic by Eden Royce. I feel like I've held this up the past three weeks. So we have this one, and, and then I finally got The Unbroken from the library, and this is more of like a military fantasy, following some conscripted child soldiers who are now being sent back to where they were born in order to quell a rebellion. Does anyone see this going well? No, I at least I don't. So, for my writing wrap up, continuing to work on Cargo Ship. I'm loosely just doing like three scenes per chapter, basically, and I'm on my third chapter. And 
right now, at least with my zero draft, I'm alternating one chapter is Maeve and the other chapter is Leo. So Maeve is now talking to her superiors about meeting Leo and what that means because she her position is not supposed to have any interaction with prisoners. I guess that is a spoiler for my story. But I mean, you find out in the first chapter. Cargo ship is a prisoner transport. And in this galactic federation, if somebody is a criminal or is a criminal in the eyes of a population, space station, planet, asteroid, whatever, but they, what their cr crime is is not a crime in the overall federation, meaning there's other places where that is not a crime, and then they can opt to have their criminal housed on a cargo ship. And the point of the cargo ship is to help the prisoner go somewhere else to settle and live. So then they don't have to deal with the stigma of being a criminal or they get, they get an opportunity to have a better life, but a better life elsewhere. Prison reform without getting to actually fix everything. I mean, it's not telling these populations that they have to be kinder or more inclusive. It's more saying, we will take the people that you don't want and help them find a place that will love them. And Maeve works. She, so, like I said, Maeve doesn't work for the, or with the prisoners. She works on the top level of the ship doing logistics and supply. So she, she does help, like, find places for prisoners to go, but she works with a liaison who says, okay, this is what I'm looking for. And then they, she helps and get all the things that pe anyone in the ship needs. I was working on that scene where she's talking to her superiors and they're discussing how they don't like the situation and how it might be the thing that, that has to be. You know, they'll figure it out. For other media, my husband and I, we finish Vox Machina this week. Vox Machina is the animated version of a D&D campaign that was done by Critical Role, and this is commonly known as Campaign 1. And when they started live streaming their ca Campaign 1, they had already been in for a while, From and this is what I understand, because I picked up in Campaign 2 and that's what I'm working on watching. But I figured going back and watching the animated version of Campaign 1 would be fine. And it was a lot of fun. My husband, who has played D&D, &D, said he definitely had those D&D &D vibes, the craziness that would happen during battles and the banter. But they did a really good job with, with their villains. <sighs> yeah. And, like, raising the stakes, the voice acting of course was superb and the people who did the animation really enjoyed it. This is a lot of fun. So if you're looking for a quirky kind of offbeat adventure like cartoon for adults and older teenagers if you are fine with that, then yeah, I would definitely say Vox Machina. We enjoyed it and now I'm looking forward to the next season. <laughs> because they leave you a nice hook to get you there. So that is my week 14 wrap-up. I think it was week 14 anyway. That's my weekly wrap-up. Yeah, I'm excited because I have next Monday and Tuesday off, and the goal is to read lots. We will see how that works.